Uh, welcome to another virtual listening session held by the members of the Board of County Commissioners. I'm Dylan Blaylock with Clackamas County's Public and Government Affairs Department, and I'll be coordinating the public comments for today's, uh, for today's meeting. Um, today's topic is supporting mental health and wellness for older adults, youth, and families during the time of coronavirus. Um, but first, we'd be remiss not to acknowledge that we are hosting this listening session, of course, during a time of national turmoil. Earlier today at the Board of County Commissioners business meeting, all five commissioners, including our two guests today, provided comments and insight about what is going on from a local perspective and what the county can do. We encourage you all to watch the clip of that commissioner's discussion, which is on our YouTube page. So that being said, uh, back to today. Uh, today's listening session will go until four o'clock or until we run out of comments and questions, whichever comes first. The session will be archived to YouTube. And we have guests with us today who are mental health experts from Clackamas County. I'll introduce them in a moment, but first we'll hear opening comments from our commissioners in attendance, Commissioner Sonia Fisher and Commissioner Martha Schrader. Commissioner Fisher, would you like to start? Thank you, Dylan. And thank you so much everyone for joining us today. During this uh, ongoing pandemic, it's been overwhelming the effect that, that this coronavirus has had on each and every one of us. And when you add to that, in the midst of this pandemic, the turmoil that is happening across our na nation to do the murder of George Floyd and the grief that that triggers in so many people in our community, having a focus on our mental health is ever, ever so important. I do want to say that during this time, we've held, held many listening sessions and virtual town halls. We have been doing this as a way to stay as connected as possible as we can with our residents. Today, we are talking about supporting mental health and wellness for older adults, youth, and families during the time of this coronavirus. And we are going to hear from two of our experts here in Clackamas County. Also, I want to make sure that everyone knows that if you have questions, you can submit them by email to clackconews at clackamas.us. We will not be taking live questions. We will be taking questions by email. So please, the address again is clackconews, C-L-A-C-K, K, not K, sorry, C0 news at clackamas.us. I also want to reinforce that while we are not taking live calls, we are here for you. We have a 24 7 crisis line, and the number is 503 655 8585. You can call that number to, um, for any reason during this time and any time, 24 hours a day. Also, I also want you to bring to your attention the, our website at www.clackamas.us slash behavioral health. And with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Commissioner Martha Schrader. Oh, Commissioner Schrader, you're muted. You're muted. Mute. Okay, I guess unmuted. All righty. I want to thank everyone for listening in today. As you know, this is the second time that we've had a listening uh, session uh, concerning mental health. The last one was in late April, and it included presentations on mental health awareness, how to ask the question if you're worried about someone who is sad and is struggling, and resources and supports for at-risk populations. And if you didn't see this presentation, I'd encourage you to watch it. There's a link from our listening sessions webpage. So if you go to our webpage, find listening sessions, you can listen to the previous conversation we've had about uh, mental health. But today we're going to be covering uh, somewhat different topics. 
These presentations will cover how the pandemic is impacting both older adults and youth and family, what services are available for these two special populations, and how you can support older adults, children, and families in your workplace and in your neighborhood. The presentation should take about 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll take comments and questions. And again, I'll reiterate, you can email your questions to CLACCO News, C-L-A-C-K-C-O-N-E-W-S at clackmas.us. And with that, I will pass it back to Dylan. All right, thank you for that, Commissioner Schrader, and thank you for that, Commissioner Fisher. Um, and as uh, the commissioners were saying, we're only taking emails today. Um, that's because we want to make sure that you all get the help you need if you want to talk with someone. Um, since these individuals aren't available right now who are with us, you can call our crisis line. Of course, I'm going to share my screen for a quick second so everyone sees. Um, if you go to clackamas.us slash coronavirus slash mental health, um, the line is right here. Review this actually is an excellent page we have with many, many resources on it. Um, if you scroll down, peer services, connection resource, and we're going to talk about those in just one second. So, okay, with that, uh, as the commissioners referenced, we're going to have some presentations and hear from our guests. Our two guests are uh, Adam Peterson, he is the supervisor of the Youth and Family Program for the Clackamas County Behavioral Health Division, where he is also involved in the division's trauma-informed care work group. He's been with the county for two and a half years, and prior to coming to Clackamas, he worked as a wraparound care coordinator, a school-based clinician, and a crisis therapist. Adam has spent his career working for with the Medicaid population and operates from a social justice perspective. Thank you very much, Adam, for joining us. <clears throat> I'll also go ahead and introduce Kim Whiteley. Kim Whiteley is the Older Adult Behavioral Spe Health Specialist with Clackamas County and has been a part of the Older Adult Behavioral Health Initiative since its inception in 2015. The focus of that initiative is to improve the quality of life for older adults by increasing access to care, by making sure that providers work together to provide coordinated, high quality physical and behavioral health care. Kim has over 20 years of experience working in community mental health. Kim, thank you for joining us too. And with that, we are going to start with Adam. So Adam, if you could take it away. Thanks, Dylan. I am incredibly honored and humbled uh, to be here today. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, and hi, Clackamas County. Uh, I'm Adam Peterson. I have the amazing privilege uh, to supervise nine of the hardest working folks you could ever meet, the Clackamas County wraparound team. Each member of my team serves 15 of the county's highest needs youth and families, helping each family to create a plan that will support them to be successful. In Wraparound, we get to work closely with all child serving systems, developmental disabilities, juvenile justice, child welfare, special education, physical health, and mental health. During this unique time, during a global pandemic, we've worked with each system as they learn how to serve youth and families and each system is doing the best they can to meet the needs while themselves are learning how to operate in this new reality. The mental health system is no different. Dylan, uh, please cue the PowerPoint. So youth and family mental health in the time of COVID-19. There is my title page. Um, <laughs> next, <laughs> next, uh, next page, Dylan. Um, the University of Denver produced a study that said in order to thrive, youth need to have the following things present in their lives. Security, stability, consistency, emotional support, love, education, positive role models, and structure. Now I want you to take a second and to think about the impact that COVID-19 has had on all of these aspects of youth thriving. And you can see that pretty much all of them have had, in, or COVID-19 has impacted each of these in one way or another. Security for many youth whose school represents security. Stability for many families have had to learn new ways of being. Parents who were working parents are now teachers. They are now trying to figure out how to, how to balance their day and creates a new reality for those families. Consistency for those same reasons emotional support, these different roles that parents and youth are playing as teacher and student and parent and child creates a new level of emotional connection, some of which 
might be pretty challenging for all youth and families. And that love is what's gonna keep families together. Education has definitely been impacted. Positive role models, many youth um, rely on schools and other role models that, that are in their lives that aren't their parents, that are now not, no longer present. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about is the impact of that lack of presence in um, child welfare and the child abuse hotline calls. Um, and then finally, structure. The youth, any structures that youth have had have changed. Some of them are, uh, Dylan, next slide, please. Um, some youth are able to create structure and some parents have families that are uh, creating an amazing structure that is allowing them to thrive. However, the majority of youth have not had the structure or routine that, that school brings them. And in that, they have not had access to those supportive adults that come to their lives in school and through school activities such as after school programming or clubs that now are no longer meeting or are meeting virtually. Um, next slide, Dylan. Um, what you can see here is um, two charts that probably don't look very clear on screen, so, um, but the colors really stand out. And that what you'll see is on, on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see child abuse hotline calls from April 2019, which are in blue. And then you'll see the child welfare, the hotline calls from 2020 in April, which are in gray. You will see that there's about a third of those calls that are happening. And normally we would be cheering and be very excited that, that there was a lack, there were so many more fewer uh, child welfare calls. However, in this instance, what we're seeing is that the youth, don't have their supportive adults in their lives that are allowing them that are usually calling the child welfare hotline hotline um, and the same is true for if you see each one of those lines represents a week um, in April and then the the chart on the right each one of those represents a a week in May of either May 2019 or May 2020 um, and those are uh, calls that are coming from the general public and calls that are coming from mandatory reporters um, and again, normally this would be something we would highlight as a huge success for our child serving systems. However, given, this, given the lack of structure and the lack of access to adults, we actually know that this means that a lot of youth are not getting their needs met and are in somewhat dangerous situations. Next slide, please, Dylan. Um, so what does that mean? Um, what supports are out there for these youth who we know are struggling or who families are needing additional resources? Um, one thing that I really wanted to highlight is the access of mental health in the time of COVID-19 has actually increased, um, not, so much, not for in-person support, but most providers are really experiencing um, the transition to web base and phone appointments is creating a new way of doing business that's allowing them to see uh, clients in a more regular basis. Um, many of our youth and families are doing half an hour appointments over phone or Zoom or other resources, other video platforms that have, we found to be highly successful. Um, and because they're able to see more youth and families, that means that there's an immediate availability. Clackamas Health Centers, Morrison Family Services, and Options Counseling all have, a made, uh, have stated that they had a made immediate availability. Um, and for those families who are wondering what outpatient services could look like, um, that could be individual therapy, family therapy, medication management, skills training, or group therapy. Um, any of those are things that could be included from an outpatient level of care. Next slide, please, Dylan. And then we're done. Okay. Um, I, so with that, I will just um, uh, just leave with a couple of points that uh, during this time, um, I've, a lot of folks have reached out and asking for just different advice that I've, I can give about um, kids being stuck indoors, parents having to be both parents and teachers, and then families getting way more quality time together than they either anticipated or wanted. Um, and the only advice that I would give is the same advice I would give to both my, the families we work with and to my friends and family, and that's to give each other grace allow yourself to take that extra minute a little t a little more tv is okay and be kind to yourselves and each other thank you dylan all right thank you very much for that adam 
Uh, next, we will hear from Kim Whiteley. Hi, and thanks again for, for having me. As Adam mentioned, I'm, I'm honored and just really grateful to have this opportunity to talk about older adults in our community. Um, I think we can just go right to the, the PowerPoint, Dylan. And there's my title page. <laughs> we can go to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to take a minute to talk about um, just how COVID-19 has really impacted the mental health and well-being of older adults. Um, in terms of mental health specifically, uh, because older adults are potentially more susceptible to COVID-19, the stress and uncertainty that that creates can really exacerbate any underlying depression or anxiety. Um, and it's really important to note with this that um, there's a myth out there that depression and anxiety are just a natural, normal part of aging, and that is absolutely not the case. Um, so we do want to pay attention to those things um, with our older adults. In terms of physical health, pain, and disability, in general, a lot of older adults have medical conditions, but they're often well managed. Pain or chronic illness, though, can affect a person's ability to function which can really impact um, their self-identity and well-being. During the COVID outbreak, having a chronic health conditions are criteria for high risk, which we know, which can just compound that stress that older adults are feeling right now. Uh, we know that loneliness and isolation are um, just huge issues for not just our older adults, but a lot of our older adults. And with the physical distancing that has had to happen, um, in particular, how that has affected so many older adults uh, being high risk. Um, we know that a lot of older adults are not able to use their usual social supports um, and the contacts have diminished. So we know that there has been a huge increase in, in that loneliness and isolation. Um, I was on a meeting earlier today and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but heard that our um, senior loneliness line has seen a huge um, uptick in calls, which is great. We want people to be using that. Um, just in the month of May alone, they had um, over 1,000 calls. Um, and then when we talk about losses, older adults experience losses more frequently than any other demographic, whether that be through um, the death of friends and family, Members. That also includes things like losing the ability to drive, um, no longer being in the workforce. Um, and COVID-19 can feel like a threat that can bring even more losses. And so it's just having that additional impact on stress and mental health of our older adult population. Next slide. So I wanted to go over a few of the local resources and services that we have. And first and foremost, um, I wanna talk about uh, the Aging and Disability Resource Center, the ADRC, and that is the local number listed there for Clackamas County. Um, and Dylan, if you don't mind just pulling up that page so folks can see. But really what I wanna get across about the ADRC is if there's no other number um, that you, you know, recall or, or anything else from the, the resources that I go over. The ADRC is really your, your one-stop shop for anything um, with aging and older adults. Call that number and they are gonna be able to connect you to a multitude of services. So I can't stress that enough. Back to the... Oh. Next is our Family Caregiver Support Program that is also part of our um, AAA and our ADRC. Um, and this really is a great resource for uh, family members who are, are caregivers, um, and that can include um, grandparents as well. And then our Senior Loneliness Line. This is a 24-7 warm line that um, anyone in the state of Oregon can call, um, specific, um, specifically targeting older adults, um, but this is just so a friendly voice on the other end of the phone um, and people can call in just to talk um, and we know that this makes a huge huge difference in people's lives and then as dylan mentioned earlier um, our clackamas county crisis and support line um, again is there 24 7. next slide dylan 
I also wanted to mention um, the AARP, specifically the Community Connections section. Um, I don't know, Dylan, if you can scroll down on there at all, but they offer so many different things. Um, perfect. They've got coronavirus news and guidance. Um, they're offering a weekly um, sort of uh, teleconference. Um, there's online community discussions. There's guidelines from the CDC. You scroll down just a little bit more, Dylan. There's also, um, they have an option that you can request a call from an AARP volunteer as well. Um, and then talking with somebody if you're experiencing anxiety or emotional distress. And they've got some really cool tools. This Savo um, can help family members coordinate to help um, another family member. So it sort of creates a schedule, even if that's just for uh, making a phone call. Um, but that way all family co members can coordinate together to help someone. And we know that as our population is aging, um, that we are seeing more and more people with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's Association has a 24 seven helpline. Um, and that's for caregivers, also for individuals, um, people with dementia um, can call anytime, even if it's just because they need a break or someone to talk to, um, but it also can be you know, a, a resource um, for a lot of different things. Lastly, I wanted to mention um, this. This is the National Clearinghouse for Abuse in Later Life. Um, this is an issue that all too often um, is overlooked, but really um, focusing on uh, interpersonal violence of older adults. Domestic violence continues to happen as people age, um, and it's often overlooked, and this is just a great website with a lot of resources and trainings um, that folks can access. So how can we support our older adults? Um, I think beyond, uh, you know, sort of the usual things that we have heard about helping them seek med medical advice or running an errand, um, if someone is experiencing um, mental health decline, uh, we often encourage them to speak to their primary care physician. Older adults are more likely to talk with their primary care physician about mental health issues or depression, anxiety, than they are to seek out other mental health treatment. Um, but really, I uh, wanted to just emphasize um, for individuals in our community, seek advice from older adults in your life based on their experience and wisdom. Um, and really express your gratitude and appreciation for the support that you get from your relationship with them. Let them know what you admire about the way that they conduct their lives. Next slide. So most importantly, really just simply communicate regularly with the older adults in your life. Um, we wanna let them know that you care, and make sure that they know that you're grateful that they're a part of your life. I also just lastly wanted to take um, just a little opportunity to talk about a new project that we are launching in Clackamas County called Clackamas County Rights to Older Adults. Um, this is a program uh, where specifically targeted really towards youth um, in our community to write a postcard, send a picture, um, to either the Senior Loneliness Line or some of our adult community centers. And they will make sure that your picture, postcard, letter gets to an isolated or lonely older adult in our community. And the last slide, I just, I believe we've just gotten this up on our Older Adult Behavioral Health website, but I wanted to um, give folks my email address if they want more information about this new program. Great. All right. Thanks very much for that, Kim. And thanks again to Adam. Uh, thank you both for your presentations. So we are going to move into uh, answering questions. And again, we are only taking questions over, uh, over email. I'm going to share my screen one last time uh, to, again, emphasize if you have a question to send in, please send it to clacconews, C-L-A-C-K, 
co and news at clackamas.us and we will try to get to as many as we can. We've had several come in, so I'm going to switch to that now. All right. Oh, but where did it go? It just left me. Okay. Uh, the first question. Can you pair older adults by their request with someone who would check in with them weekly and speak to them and listen to them for 15 minutes to an hour on a pre-scheduled and regular basis by phone? The impact on my mom specifically has been extreme isolation, loss of personal connection, and missing the, person, the personal in-person contact, smiling faces, and reassuring exchanges with friends, family, and her Meals on Wheels delivery volunteers. Please help us maintain the mental health and well-being of our most vulnerable. Thank you for listening and asking. Would anyone like to take that? I'll take a stab at that one. Um, so really, I, I would encourage um, the Senior Loneliness Line um, is also able to take referrals and make outgoing calls. Um, but oftentimes, um, if somebody wants to call in and speak to the same person each time, um, once they call in, um, they can find out sort of when that person that they are talking to um, is sort of on that schedule. And the likelihood is that they most often will, can't be a guarantee, but they most often will get that same uh, person answering their call at the senior loneliness line um, if they're calling in at those times. So that would be my suggestion for that. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, next question. Hello. I'd like to ask the commissioners about the steps they are taking to protect funding for programs serving older adults and young people struggling with mental health. Amidst discussion about state budget cuts, many of these programs will be impacted and at risk of closure. Also, are there any steps the public can take to advocate about this? Thank you very much. And of course, we just had our budget hearings last week. Commissioners Fisher or Schrader, who would like to uh, respond? Commissioner Fisher, do you want to start? Sure. So I would love, Dylan, if you could let me give me the contact information for the person that asked that most excellent question. I would love to have further dialogue. This is a really critical question, and it's one that, um, quite frankly, I've been very, very concerned about. As Commissioner Schrader has served on the Executive Committee for the Association of Oregon Counties as the immediate past president, I have the privilege and honor of being vice chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. And mental health funding is key on our agenda that's going, that we are promoting through that um, statewide association. So that coupled with our excellent lobbying team that we have in Clackamas County that absolutely prioritizes our mental health funding. It is so true that we are absolutely dependent on state and federal resources for our mental health funding programs. And so we absolutely need our people that care about this issue to become engaged, to talk to me, to talk to the other commissioners, but to also talk with legislators and even your members of Congress to talk about how critical this is. What I am most concerned about is with the coronavirus, we know that mental health is a key, key priority, but the impacts of this pandemic are, of course, they're right now, but they're gonna be seen off into the future for quite some time. So as we are dealing with the economic constraints, we can't lose sight of what is most important in the foundation for services for people as we move into the recovery from this pandemic. And I'd like to add a little bit to that. Um, thank you, Sonia, that's a wonderful answer. One of the things I, I'll underscore is that we have a very supportive legislative delegation and we meet with them regularly uh, as a group. They have what they call a Clackamas County Caucus. And this has come up more than once in our conversations with them. And also Representative Prusak, uh, Rachel Prusak, who is a nurse practitioner, uh, Commissioner Fisher and I have an opportunity uh, on Fridays, we do a check-in 
not only uh, with, with the representative, but other uh, local elected officials in the area. So we're poised to watch what happens, I think, in a legislative, next legislative session. I think that there more than likely will be a special session. And we have not just ourselves but an, and our fellow commissioners, but another, a number of other allies that will help us lobby to make sure that the funding for the most vulnerable does not get absolutely decimated. I will also give a shout out, as Commissioner Fisher did, to our uh, delegation uh, in the federal level. They too are very, very interested in making sure that vulnerable adults, both our senators and our uh, representative delegation there, to continue to make sure that dollars don't dry up at, at that level as well. Um, we are gonna be meeting once a month on budget issues. Um, we are gonna have a constrained budget, but uh, what are, we have balanced our budget, will be, we have, it is balanced right now, but given the uncertainty with COVID-19 and the uncertainty of revenue streams, we will be meeting monthly, not only with our commissioners, but with our, um, our team of budget citizens with part of our budget committee uh, to constantly review how we're going to adapt as things move forward. So um, we're on it. Um, I'm glad I have such great colleagues to work with both as citizens and as commissioners. Thank you very much, Commissioner Schrader and Commissioner Fisher. Uh, the next question, uh, hello, I have a family that has private insurance but are very low income. They do not get OHP because they have private insurance. How can they, how can they, the, I think, afford the mental health they need for their child, given the out-of-pocket expense is too much for them to afford? Um, that's a really hard question to answer because there's not an easy answer. Um, their most private insurance requires a copay um, for when people access behavioral health. Um, so even if we do a, uh, there are many programs out there that do a sliding fee scale um, that will make it um, more, more affordable for those who are in private insurance to access behavioral health care. Um, there may still be a copay um, involved. So there, my recommendation would be for seeking um, seeking mental health services for youth on private insurance is to uh, first of all ask, uh, ask about sliding fee scales from those uh, from the programs or pr individual practitioners that you're talking to um, and then really try to engage with those uh, those in a way that um, is going to meet the youth and families needs the best they possibly can knowing that sometimes there's it's still a real challenge and that's something that is we're working on at a, a system of care level um, with our tri-county system of care group. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, let me see, next question um, uh, goes on for a minute or so, but um, it's okay. Uh, good day. My question is centered around finding mental health professionals. I am over 65 and do have mental health coverage through my Medicare Advantage plan. I used their provider finder on the website and called them for names of providers as well. The ones I contacted in Clackamas County all told me they do not treat those in my age group. And I've called nine of them. The term they used was mm. geriatric. I did go through my PCP who is in the Providence system and he referred me to Providence's screening process. I saw a mental health professional in Milwaukee. She did an assessment, but since I was not in a critical situation, they were unable to offer any services. I've seen someone in Portland, but she has cash only, and I'm unable to submit her bills to my insurance, and my budget will not sustain any more visits. I've been a consumer of mental health services for many years. I was with my last provider for 15 years until his retirement in August 2015. My mental health uh, medications are handled by my PCP. I have been on with them with no changes since 2016, and treatment for my condition is prescription and talk therapy. My mental health diagnosis is pretty straightforward, and I feel I am fairly stable. I am very proactive in my health and mental health treatment. Now that you have my experience and background, how do I go about finding a professional that will treat me in Clackamas County? Who do I call or contact? COVID-19 has done a number on me mentally, and I know I will need some extra support once we move into the final phases. Um, transportation is not an issue. 
would like to tackle that. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, this speaks to an issue that we know is unfortunately all too common for older adults. Um, there are very few providers, unfortunately, um, that do take Medicare um, in terms of mental health treatment. It can be a real challenge um, to find a, a provider. I would really encourage um, them to probably contact our Clackamas County Crisis and Support Line because um, those folks may be able to assist you with folks that are currently accepting uh, Medicare, and that would be the place that I would start. Okay. All right, thank you very much for that, Kim. Uh, next question, what is the best way to encourage an older adult that says they are lonely, but are very reluctant to call the senior loneliness, loneliness line? Uh, thanks for your attention. I'll unmute again. Um, I, I would um, encourage this actually is a scenario that, that even came up earlier today um, when I was sort of doing an impromptu case consultation. Um, and often it can be really scary to call into some line that you don't know who's gonna answer or what that's gonna be like. So I would encourage if you have, um, it sounds like it maybe it was a family member or somebody who was reluctant to call, um, that you call with them. If you have the ability to do a three-way call, um, that you call in uh, together with them. Um, if they're willing to do that, that can be a little less scary. Um, and you can kind of talk at first if that's more comfortable for them. Um, and then also uh, the Senior Loneliness Line, I think I mentioned earlier, also will take referrals. You can call the line if um, the older adult is willing to have somebody from the line um, reach out to call them. That's also an option. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is connecting to um, their local senior center, adult community center. Um, although a lot of them have limited uh, programming, they do have um, community uh, service specialists that are reaching out to um, older adults in their community. So that could be an additional support. Um, and then maybe also the ADRC um, that I mentioned earlier, aging and uh, Disability Resource Center. They have, um, in Clackamas County, we have a senior companion program. Um, so those are all, I think, some good options. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Kim. Uh, let me see, next question. What is something that parents can do to support children's mental health and wellness other than seeking mental health support? Do you wanna take that, Adam? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, great question. Um, I think it's really, instead of like seeking mental health support, it would really be seeking wellness support and to do things that make, make your, your youth and family happy, like to get out there in the sun, to do activities together that are positive and that really are um, giving attention to the youth and to um, getting, having real conversations and um, the more active that it can be the better that's going to be for their body, for their soul, for their, for their mind. And I think so get outside, do be together, support each other to do things that make you happy and really connect with each other, connect with families and connect with other family members in ways that are safe. Uh, and then to really make sure that you're just, again, as I mentioned, um, take, Taking that space and that extra breath um, when things get a little tense to um, take that extra second before responding. All right, thank you for that. Uh, next up, a question for the commissioners. Uh, commissioners, what ways has the commission, the BCC, shown that mental health is a priority for the county? Well, let me let me start with that. When you take a look at our website, you will see the uh, the, the wide scope of programming that we have dedicated to mental health for our children, our seniors, and our families. I believe it's one of the more robust uh, uh, pieces of our um, uh, human resources um, function that we have at the county. 
we have it for young people. We have it for elderly people. Um, I was just looking up, for example, when you mentioned the Senior Companion Program and looked, looked at that. But if you go to our website, you can take a look at each area and each section that we have continued to provide uh, as a county that I think is, is pretty remarkable. And I don't know, Sonia, do you have anything to add with that? We, um, I think we do a, a, actually a pretty excellent job, but that is also because of staff like Adam and staff like Kim, who are professionals and dedicated to our youth and our seniors. So I think that, um, just to add, Commissioner Schroeder is absolutely right, our website really does highlight the strength of our behavioral health programs. But we also strategically think about these things. And one of our, um, we have performance clackamas and a, a major <laughs> principle and value of that is safe, secure communities and really being healthy. And that includes mental health. We also have a value for active lifestyles, which is a lens that we look through our, um, programs and the different things that we do. And active lifestyle is so much more than being able to take a walk. It's being able to be connected. It's being active. It's also for mental health. It's to be connected. And in a time of the pandemic, it's ever so, so challenging. But I would say that one of the things, and I was, um, before being a commissioner, a lawyer in family law, and also I worked years ago with Multnomah County, and I'm a mother of a child with developmental disabilities, so I've been a consumer of the services at Clackamas County. I've seen and worked with systems all around the state as the former legislative director for the Department of Human Services. And I can just tell you unequivocally, there's a special kind of heart of community in Clackamas County that really cares about the residents in a way that will go that extra mile. And I think that that far preceded me as a commissioner, probably didn't precede so much Commissioner Schrader because she's been around the commission much longer than I have, but there's been excellent leadership that has fostered this sense of community and caring for the people that live in Clackamas County. And uh, we have a heart and it's a really beautiful, beautiful thing. So. Thank you both for that, Commissioners Fisher and Schrader. I think that's a good opportunity for me to also share, um, speaking about how many resources the county has uh, put forth with mental health. Um, and this is our website that is only, um, only our coronavirus slash mental health website, which is available right from our coronavirus page. It talks about the, um, obviously our 24 seven um, number for those in crisis. But if you scroll down, it does uh, show a lot of different resources we have on it, some of which we directly operate, like the Senior Loneliness, not loneliness Line, excuse me, and our Crisis and Support Lines, and it really does um, have a litany of additional uh, resources that, um, that are available to everybody. Mm -hmm. So just thought I'd share that real quick. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, let me see. Okay, next question. Uh, I've heard that the calls for reporting child abuse are down during this time, as we showed earlier. Are the calls for elder abuse also down? I guess that would be to Kim, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, definitely uh, from what I have heard um, from our, our partners at Adult Protective Services that initially, yes, um, during this uh, pandemic crisis, the calls um, for elder abuse had decreased the same way they had for child abuse. And I think much for the same reasons that Adam mentioned earlier is that um, with the physical distancing, <laughs> um that we there's just not as many eyes on folks um as there was before and i, I think that's why it's, i want to emphasize so much um how important it is to even if it is by phone connecting with the older adults um in your life um in our community um and and really i would say to to um do some online research and, and educate yourself um more, I, I encourage all of the community to do this, educate yourself more on what the signs of elder abuse can be because they're often overlooked. Um, and so I really encourage people to um, get, get familiar um, with what those signs are and notice older adults. Um, 
and I, I, again, I think too, I just wanted to, to reiterate that, um, you know, domestic violence continues to happen as well. Whenever we think about elder abuse, most people don't think necessarily about interpersonal violence. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's an area that's, as I said, too often overlooked and it does continue to happen. Um, and I think part of that is just ageism in our society that we don't think that that continues to happen with older adults, but it does. Um, and so I would encourage folks to also take advantage of the other website that I had mentioned, the National Clearinghouse for Abuse in Later Life to really educate yourself on, on this issue. Ellen, can I make a, just a point about something that we have that's in Clackamas County that I think we need to highlight? Yes, that please pretty phenomenal. Um, we have an extremely robust uh, peer support uh, mm -hmm. programming here in Clackamas County. Um, it's something that is, it, it can be a really amazing way for people to connect that's not, not with a person who's a trained therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist. It's okay. with somebody who has, who has that lived experience. Um, and it's somebody who's been through many of the things that, um, that uh, mental health concerns or syst system involvement that other people might be going through. And it's somebody who's walked their sh walked that same path before. And it's something that it may be a great way for some of these people who may be seeking traditional mental health services can seem really intimidating or just something they don't want to do. Um, we have an amazing peer support network that is also highlighted on that website for us in the child serving, child serving world. Youth Era is a wonderful resource that we have a youth drop-in center in, um, in, Milwaukee that's just phenomenal and they they provide they can provide phone phone support for youth as well and we also have the Oregon Family Support Network um, who can support parents in need and they have amazing resources as well and it's something that there's many adult peer organizations and that I'm not as familiar with but that do great work for adults who are also going through same uh, through things as well and so I just think it was it's really important that I bring that up as well. Thank you very much for that, Adam, and thanks again, Kim. Oh, Kim, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? I was just going to add, we also have um, two older adult peers um, in, in Clackamas County, so thanks, Adam, for bringing that up. And then the other thing I'll add on that is we did receive um, a comment from the executive director of um, uh, NAMI Clackamas, National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm sorry, is it NAMI or NAMI? I'm not sure, however you said it. You got it. You're okay. Great job, Dylan. All right, and she's reminding us, uh, don't forget Nami Clackman says, free mental health support and education for seniors and families, regardless of insurance or income. You can find out more at Nami CC, so N-A-M-I-C-C dot org. Um, Nami does not do diagnosis or treatment, but lots of programs provided by and for people who live with mental health issues or those who love them. So thank you very much for that comment. And, oh, and yeah. Dylan, could you, could you also mention Folk Time? I think that's another organization that we work with, and that's peer-to-peer -peer support. Let me look it up um, real quick, but I can get it. It's, it's a really excellent program, and I've known folks who have had uh, other family mem members who have needed that peer support use it and have been very, very happy with it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I think it's listed uh, there, yeah. Is it, is it this, Commissioner Schrader? Yes. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. so it's folktime.org. With shared lived experience, yeah. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer program. Um, I had a very close friend whose daughter had some serious issues, and he has been now a lifetime supporter of that particular program because it helped his daughter so much as she was going through her mental health crisis. So I kind of have a soft spot for that one. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, okay, we have one or two more, and then I think we'll probably finish up. Uh, another one that just came in. One of our good friends has a wonderful son in high school who we've known since he was a boy. Since the pandemic, he's been really, really stressed. They are super worried because he seems to be withdrawing from friends, broke up with his girlfriend. He still talks to us and his parents, but it feels like all his joy and energy are gone. Um, and then just ends. Thank you for your thoughts. Adam. 
Yeah, I, I think that would be a great uh, time to call that 503-655-8585 and talk to our crisis and support line. Those folks are absolutely trained on um, looking for signs and symptoms of mental health concerns. And then you know they get a list, a daily list of where um, there are openings in our county for um, immediate access. So um, I think my recommendation would be to give our crisis and support line a call and um, they will work with you to find out some more information and then maybe to offer some ideas and suggestions of where to go. Um, and then often they'll consult with me and my team about if it's something that's really come um, more complex than simple or not, there is no simple mental health concern, but more if there's a, some complexity or some multi-system involvement, um, that's when they'll bring in um, our team to start consulting with us to talk about other options or additional supports besides maybe the, what's in their toolbox. So, but that's a wonderful place to start. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for that, Adam. And looking at the time, another one has just come in. Um, I think it's geared toward commissioners. With the, with the upcoming economic crunch from the COVID-19 pandemic on communities and all of the needs out there, um, how can we justify paying for these types of services over others? So a matter of priority, I guess, prioritizing. Commissioners? Well, let me just say that one of the things we do as commissioners, I think, is hone our personal skills for compassion towards those less fortunate. And as Sonia mentioned earlier, we have performance blackness. And so one of our values, the lens that we look through is um, basically ensuring health and safe communities. And that means children, that means seniors, that means the elderly. I mean, it, it, it really, anyone who needs that kind of support. Um, it's one of the biggest, things that we do as a county. It's one of the things that makes us different from cities in that part of our governance infrastructure is that safety net for the most vulnerable in our population. So not only, you know, as I said, we have 16 cities in this county. They, ha they have transportation they have roads, they have permitting, so on and so forth. But what they do not have available, okay, that we do, because we go after federal and state dollars constantly and keep that eye on the prize constantly is the social uh, commitment and the social safety net that we are dedicated to maintaining. And without the county's work in these arenas, we wouldn't have that safety net. And I'm gonna hand it off to Commissioner Fisher because she's been doing a stellar job with the Association of Oregon Counties uh, Human Resources Group because that is not just our county. That is amassing all 36 counties across the spectrum of this entire state, lobbying and working down in Salem and at the federal level for the services that we want to maintain for our most vulnerable citizens. Sonia, you have anything you want to add there? So. Yeah, so the lens that we have had in Clackamas County for far before I came to Clackamas County is really looking at the safety net. And if you look at where we need to focus collectively as a community is for those that struggle the most. There is a, a famous quote that says that um, the true measure of any society is how it treats its most vulnerable. So wherever that is, whether it's with our seniors or with yeah. our children, with our infants, with our people with mental health challenges or developmental disabilities or other challenges, we really need to collectively focus on those that are the most needy. And I think that's very poignant now when we are um, in such a pivotal point in not only our nation, in our state, in our county, but in the world, when we're looking at this coronavirus, which has affected each and every one of us on this planet, and now across not only our country, but across the world, people are coming out and protesting the inhumanity of people of a certain 
color, African-American men being afraid and, and being murdered on our streets and saying, no, this is not okay. We have to do better. We need a better society. So whatever it is, collectively, we have to use our voice and our strength to help those that need it. Well said. Thank you very much, Commissioner Fisher, and thanks, Commissioner Schrader, uh, before that. Commissioner Schrader, you referenced this, and I think it was referenced earlier in the conversation as well. If anyone is interested in seeing the Commissioner's Performance Clackamas Plan, yes. it is on yeah. the screen now. Um, you can go to clackamas.us slash performance, and this is the page for it. You can see the, the five priorities right here, but a better link for it is if you click this Read the Plan, and you can really get into, oh, it's just loading for a quick sec. Please come on. There we go. Um, uh, it was updated earlier this year, and you can read through and see exactly what the priorities of are. the commission are. Let me go ahead and do it down here, and you can see this one that was just referenced: ensure safe, healthy, and secure uh, communities. Okay. So, thank you again for referencing that, uh, Commissioner Schrader. Okay, let's see if we have any uh, last questions, real quick. Um, yes, there's one last one, and then I think look at the time. This will be the final one. Is there any thought or ideas around reaching out in some way to youth and families that schools might be concerned about? Uh, kids that the schools haven't heard from? That's, that's the question. Um, there's not any direct um, way to access a behavioral health resource that will outreach to folks that they're worried about in, in that way that I'm aware of. Um, what I do know though is that there are so many caring school professionals out there that they're making those phone calls um, and that they're the one, they're reaching out to those youth and families that they're concerned about and, and that they're, they're a really good first level of contact and I think that we've really our division has developed really strong relationships with our local school districts that if they did mm -hmm. if there were anyone who was they were concerned about there's they we have a threat assessment protocol that i think they would utilize us in that way similar to reach out and then i'm sure if there are any school district uh representatives out there feel free to contact me we'll figure out something uh, to do to reach out to those youth that you're concerned about very good. Thank you for that, Adam. And I want to thank our guests, Adam and Kim, Adam Peterson and Kim Whiteley, uh, for being here. Commissioners, do you have any uh, parting words before we uh, say goodbye to our attendees? Do you want to go first, Commissioner? Fisher? Sure. Do you, you, you go ahead. Okay. It's always that challenge of the unmute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So thank you everyone for participating, for the wonderful questions, to our wonderful experts. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Adam. And Dylan, thank you, because you really run these so well. And Commissioner Schrader, it's such an honor and a privilege to serve with thank you. Thank you. So appreciate you. So my parting words are, let's continue to reach out to those we care about. Let's continue, even if it's a simple little text, how you doing? a quick phone call, continue to engage, to reach out, and especially for um, people who may be triggered by recent events that are struggling a little extra, please, please, please just say, how are you? I care about you. That goes a long way in helping to um, build security and safety in our communities is through our connection, which is so incredibly challenging mm -hmm. now with social distancing. So I appreciate everyone participating and uh, carrying this message on to others that you know. Okay. So just let me add, as one of those senior citizens, I've been around for a while and I've had many years right now, I guess, in public and community service and if anyone had ever told me that I would be uh, a public servant in the middle of uh, a pandemic, I, I don't know if I would have believed it. But I think that we will do in the end, I always say this, all will be well. We will get through the suffering. We will get through the pain. We will work continue to work to end racism as we know it. I know that that's a big thing on everyone's mind. Um, I'm a big fan of Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Desmond Tutu 
and Martin Luther King and all those folks who talked to us and taught us about uh, resistance, nonviolent resistance. So as we move forward in troubled times, know that the troubles will end at some time, but we all need to remain kind to one another. We need to respect one another. We need to show um, compassion and love to one another. That is one of the ways that I think that we will get through uh, these very interesting times that we are living in now. And um, it's a privilege and to serve with Commissioner Fisher and our staff, Adam and Dylan and Kim. And it's a privilege to be of service because uh, it really, it's really about servant leadership. And in this time in particular, being a servant of the people is uh, a very arduous task, but is a, it's a task I believe my colleagues and I welcome with open arms because we care about the citizens in our county. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, staff. Um, we're gonna be living in interesting times, but we have one another. And the, you and the commission, I have to say, the staff and the people I work with are and, are and always will be part of my family. So thank you. Well said, Commissioner Schrader. Thank you very much. And thank you for your words as well at the end there, Commissioner Fisher. Very well put. That's it for this listening session. Thank you for joining us. This session will be archived to YouTube by the end of the day. Um, feel free to share the link with anyone, of course. Uh, and I want to thank again Adam Peterson and Kim Whiteley for joining us today. Really appreciate it. The Board of County Commissioners will continue listening sessions. We will have news on the next one probably next. Uh, the news about it will come okay. out next week. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.